Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have Julie and Jerry Brown. Jerry has been on the show before, and uh, Julie and Jerry contributed to our blog recently. This episode, we get into some interesting stuff around how mystical states can heal and um, perhaps how they might even be able to heal you know, more obvious situations in the body as well. Uh, we'll kind of get into that in a bit. Julie hasn't been on the show before, but she's a psychotherapist, uh, now retired, uh, has done a lot of work with cancer patients over the last bunch of decades and has done a lot of guided imagery, which I think is really interesting. And I, I think there's there's some value here and some correlation that all of you interested in psychedelic states might also be interested in. So hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you, Julie and Jerry, for joining and please let us know what you think. You can email us at psychedelicstodayemail at gmail.com. We've got a huge Facebook group. Just search Psychedelics Today group on Facebook and you'll find it. And yeah, we're all over social. So definitely please hit us up. And uh, if you want, <laughs> we've got a lot of education over at the Psychedelic Education Center. So psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Some courses are becoming CE approved. So stay tuned uh, on that. And we've got some free classes there and more and more coming soon. So we're just planning to expand that a whole bunch. So hope you check it out. I think that's it for now. So enjoy this episode with Julie and Jerry Brown, and we'll see you on the other side. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Julie and Jerry Brown, co-authors of the Psychedelic Gospels and of the uh, recent Psychedelics Today article titled Mystical Experience and Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy, which is what we're going to talk about today. Julie Brown, MA, LMHC psychotherapist, now retired, worked with cancer patients for over three decades and Jerry Brown, PhD anthropologist, studies the role of psychedelics in religion. So great to have you both here. Thanks for being willing to join us. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, we want to explore in some depth today the role of mystical experience, the key role of mystical experience in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and draw some comparisons with mystical experience that Julie. Uh, facilitates uh, with her cancer patients uh, through using guided imagery without mm. psychedelics in psychotherapy. Uh, let me step back a little bit. Albert Hoffman, uh, who synthesized LSD uh, after LSD became a uh, global cultural phenomenon, especially in the USA and Europe, wrote a book called LSD, My Problem Child. Mm. And Stanislav Grof, the father of LSD psychotherapy, uh, said that about that, that LSD is actually not a problem child, but a child prodigy born into a dysfunctional family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as we see it, the psychedelic renaissance has provided successful family therapy for this dysfunctional <laughs> family. And psychedelics are finally beginning to take their rightful place in our world. Uh, personally, for Julie and me, who began our own uh, psychedelic journeys quite some time ago, back in the uh, 1960s and 1970s, we're amazed and delighted to see now, over half a century later, the second coming of uh, psychedelics. So I'm glad we're not on video today. Uh, we're getting a little old here and uh, certainly disheveled from the virus. Uh, talking about <laughs> the second coming of uh, psychedelics, our main research today, uh, as you know, has been on um, mushrooms, identifying mushroom images in Christian art. And what we did, uh, we traveled through Europe and the Middle East, photographing and identifying Amanita muscaria and psilocybin mushroom images in Christian art, mm. frescoes, uh, stained glass windows in churches and cathedrals in Europe and the Middle East, which we published in our book, The Psychedelic Gospels. Given our own personal life-changing mystical experiences, and Julie's going to describe one of hers in this conversation, and our awareness of the seminal role 
that mystical experience plays in shamanism and world religions, we were very intrigued to see this quote coming out of the NYU and the Johns Hopkins studies on the impact of psilocybin with cancer patients, where they found that psilocybin reduced anxiety, depression, and fear of death. And the quote goes like this from NYU and Johns Hopkins. In both trials, the intensity of the mystical experience described by the patients correlated with the degree to which their depression and anxiety decreased. In other words, and let, let's focus on this for a second. We are now at a point where research scientists at NYU, Johns Hopkins, and in other uh, universities have been able to regularly create mystical experience, what we've known as flights of the soul, traditionally thought to be beyond the scope of empirical science. They've been able to create occasion, generate, facilitate mystical experience in clinical settings by administering high-dose synthetic psilocybin. Mm. And furthermore, it turns out, as this quote showed, that these mystical experiences hold the key to positive patient outcomes in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So let's let this enigma of scientists generating mystical experiences that were always seen to be the area of religion beyond science. Let this enigma uh, sink in for a minute. Actually, this was not too surprising to us because uh, in a chapter called The Miracle of Marsh Chapel in our book, uh, we had written about two other uh, seminal studies on mystical experience with psychedelics. One of them was done back in 1962 by Walter Pankey, who was a graduate student in Timothy Leary's Harvard Psilocybin Project before Leary and his colleagues got booted out of Harvard. And what they did was a double-blind psilocybin study, which took place in Marsh Chapel uh, on the campus of uh, Boston University. And Pankey took two groups of Protestant divinity students. This was a controlled double-blind study. He divided him, uh, he took one group of 20, divided him into two groups. One received uh, about um, 30 milligrams of psilocybin, and the control group received um, a dose of niacin, vitamin B12, which kind of gives you an energy rush. Neither the divinity students nor the clinical observers knew who was getting what. In the results, nine out of 10 of the divinity students who took the psilocybin had a full-blown religious or mystical experience, including Houston Smith, who participated in the study, and as many of us know, became a very distinguished professor of religion. He called it the most powerful cosmic homecoming that I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Now I truly understand the words that I've been reading in the Bible. <laughs> uh, in a scale that Panky developed, he did a six month follow up, and they, the, the uh, divinity students who had the psilocybin still described it as a very significant experience. Mm. Now let's fast forward to 25 years to 1987, and Rick Doblin, who uh, many of your listeners will know as the founder of uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, for his uh, PhD research, Rick uh, found and interviewed seven of the nine divinity students who had the psilocybin. And they said it was still one of the most valuable life experiences they ever had and produced lifelong benefits for them. And as part of his conclusion, of writing this study up, Rick said that, look, it is obvious that the mystical experience uh, created by psychedelics is no different from non-drug mystical uh, experience. Mm. Now, of course, we ran into the 1970 Nixon's Controlled Substance Act, where uh, these, this research was officially banned. Some of it had been banned earlier on uh, psychedelics on human subjects. 
all this great research that went on in the 50s and 60s kind of got forgotten in the hysteria of the 70s. But in the 19, uh, in the 2000s, Roland Griffiths, who we, many of us revere as the grandfather of the psychedelic renaissance, a very distinguished psychopharmacologist who uh, was an expert in drug addiction, had 300 peer-reviewed papers uh, uh, to his credit before he got into psychedelic research. Uh, He did a series of studies at Johns Hopkins with psilocybin on uh, healthy people. He found and they, they showed that in a series of papers that it was safe to give it in a structured clinical setting that it created, again, uh, one of the top five most meaningful life experiences for the majority of the subjects. And the improvements in mood and quality of life um, had lasted for over a year, for 14 months, which was the follow-up. So the essence of this is obviously the mystical experience. And unless you have any questions, I'd like to turn now to to Julie's um, own mystical experience with cosmic consciousness. Yeah, I think that would be great, Julie. And then perhaps after um, we can kind of talk about what we generally consider other mystical states. But yeah, Julie, I'd love to hear about yours. Sure. Um, Well, mine was in uh, 1969. I went to a music festival with a couple of friends outside of Philadelphia. I lived in New York City at the time. And uh, at that time, I was an introspective, insecure 21 year old mm. uh, one of my friends who was a chemist uh, came to the, the uh, music festival also and he gave us uh, a combination of psychedelics mm-hmm. including DMT I found uh, a place to lie down on the grass and I ingested the entheogens and um as the first group came on, a gospel group, I laid back on the grass and I closed my eyes and became very relaxed, listening to the music as the sun started to set. And after a while, I noticed colorful patterns behind my closed eyelids and felt the same tingly feeling in my gut that I had gotten on previous trips. And out of nowhere, though the sky was getting dark outside, inside my eyelids, the light was getting brighter and brighter. And suddenly, shockingly, I was traveling outward and upward towards space so fast that I felt like I was shot out of cannon at the speed of light. I sped on and on and on, seeing these intense flashes of light and color. So everything slowed down, and the streaks condensed into stars. So as I moved through space, I began to notice that every star had a face and that I recognized every face and felt a loving connection to each and every one. I became aware that my experience was in a cosmic dimension and was unlike any entheogenic encounter I had ever known. I did not dwell on this, though. I simply experienced the beauty of it all, the utter magnificence of being connected to every particle and person in existence. And the next afternoon, when I became conscious of the earthly plane again, I sat up and observed that I was at a music concert and had missed the entire event. Almost everyone was gone. I was left with some profound alterations of my mind and body. I was less afraid of everything, even death. I felt free and at peace. Most importantly, I realized I was connected to every living thing and felt so much love for myself and all life. And although this experience of cosmic consciousness took place over 40 years ago, over 50, <laughs> it produced many, you know, many great changes in my life that I'm still grateful for today. So talk about a uh, long-lasting experience. <laughs> right. uh, and what, what I'd like to um, put this in the context of are that Julie's mystical experience of cosmic consciousness contains what Johns Hopkins and other researchers have come to identify as the five common elements 
of a mystical experience. And these are unity and sacredness. And, and Panky developed a scale for a questionnaire for identifying and, and talking to the subjects in his Miracle of Marsh Chapel research to attempt to, to quantify and see the intensity of their mystical experience. Johns Hopkins has refined this into a 30-question myst mystical experience questionnaire. And the five main elements identified in that questionnaire are first, unity and sacredness. A deep sense of unity with all of existence and a profound sense of reverence for the experience. Uh, the second thing is the positive mood. Obviously, Julie felt an incredible sense of well-being and an, ex an experience of peace and tranquility. The third element is the transcendence of time and space. Uh, the person is out of beyond the past, present, and the future. They lose uh, their usual sense of time or, or where they are. The fourth element is the experience is one of full knowing. It's an authoritative experience. It is undeniable, the truth that's carried in it. And one feels at times that, as Julie did, she, she came to know and trust her authentic self. And the last and fifth element, it's ineffable. It's indescribable. In other words, uh, Julie talked to you about her experience, but obviously it's difficult to describe a complete experience like that in words. So now let's turn to a minute, uh, for a minute, to the Johns Hopkins research in which mystical experience was the key to a positive outcome for these cancer patients. And these are people who are suffering from advanced cancer. In the 2016 psilocybin cancer study, which was and remains today the largest controlled study of its kind, there were 51 patients. Uh, they had a number of uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, depression, anxiety, and about a third of them were suffering from both depression and anxiety in the face of um, what looked like a terminal illness. About 51% of them had tried depression or anti-anxiety medications in the past. About two-thirds of them had a, uh, a recurrent current uh, cancer, and 35% of them were dealing with the poss possible recurrence of their cancer. Uh, the high dose psilocybin was in the range of 22 or 30 milligrams of psilocybin for 70 kilograms of body weight. So about 30 milligrams for uh, about 155 pounds of body weight. And um, on the lower high dose, 22 milligrams, uh, just for perspective, that'd be equivalent to about um, four dried grams of psilocybin cubensis mushrooms. Uh, in that study and in the follow-up, what they found was that 70% of the participants in the study, uh, after receiving the high dose amount six months after it, described that experience as one of the top five most meaningful lifetime experiences, and also at the same time, one of the top five most significantly spiritual experiences they've ever had in their life. And Griffiths, looking at this research, uh, reached a conclusion, and I quote, high dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinician and self-rated measures of depressed mood and anxiety, produced increases in the quality of life, life meaning and optimism, and decreases in death anxiety. And these results caused this researcher, lead researcher, Roland Griffiths, to exclaim, and I quote again, as a scientific phenomena, if you can create a condition in which 70% of the subjects achieve positive lasting results in one or two sessions, well, even we researchers uh, are left in awe uh, by that. So before we turn to uh, Julie's work of mystical experience with uh, guided imagery, uh, are there any questions you have at, at this point, Joe? Huh. I'm kind of curious, Jerry. Like, I'm I came up in kind of a philosophy program, so I get to hear all these kind of uh, historical mystical 
experiences. And it, it seemed as though they stopped at a certain point in history, but I, I'm kind of curious. Well, and they obviously didn't stop, but I'm kind of curious about like, uh, do, do you have any favorite kind of um, stories of a historical figure having a mystical experience that you like to reference ever? I, I certainly do. But I think for continuity, uh, I think it'd be better to jump into Julie's uh, research at this point before sure. we lose the thread and we can come yeah, back to absolutely. that later Great. if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. totally. Uh, so Julie's going to talk a little bit now, and it's a great question about guided imagery in her, in her own work. So um, therapy with guided imagery is, is, is what I did um, for all those years, and I actually am still working with cancer patients, amazingly. But uh, guided imagery or visualization is a technique in which psychotherapists help clients focus on mental images in order to facilitate deep relaxation and healing and resolution of life issues. In psychotherapy with guided imagery, a client can call on mental images to improve emotional and physical health, at times entering a state of mystical experience. And um, the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy versus guided imagery therapy, they're, very, they're quite different. Uh, the John, Johns Hopkins protocol is non-directive, encouraging psilocybin study participants to trust, let go, and be open without providing any instruction on how or where to focus. In contrast, what I did was, um, and I didn't work with, you know, I worked with guided imagery um, and not with psychedelics. Uh, in contrast, the guided imagery modality is directed, with the therapist purposefully focusing clients in order to evoke images and assisting clients in processing and integrating these images. And the key question that I asked all my cancer clients in a state of relaxation, I would ask them to understand, to try to get to the bottom of why they thought they might have gotten cancer. And I would ask them, you know, what is it that you wanted in your life? And what is it that you really, really need? That's the bottom line. What is it that you really, really need? And every one of my clients, realized eventually that they really needed what they really really needed was to be taken care of to be nurtured and that they didn't feel nurtured in their lives as either as children and or in relationships as adults and that's a really important um, question to ask so I have a, a couple of clients I wanted to, to talk to you about and thought might be interesting to people. Um, their their um, profiles of these two uh, past clients of mine with guided imagery therapy outcome. And the first one is a male. Uh, he was a physician, cardiologist, and uh, he had fourth stage prostate cancer. And um, after two years after, his conventional treatment, he, working with me, he became cancer-free. Um, his guided image that we, he used a lot was his spiritual self. And uh, a main mystical experience was, uh, the elements of his main mystical experience was the feeling of unity and oneness, and also his authentic self. Uh, the outcome of the therapy with him was reduced anxiety and full remission. Um, so that's client one. Client two is a, a female. She was a graduate student. She had third stage breast cancer. And uh, she, um, after one and a half years of after conventional cancer treatment, she worked with me for one and a half years. And her guided image was her, her warrior self. And her main mystical experience was outside of um, through time and space and positive mood. Her outcome was reduced anxiety and full remission. And both of these were um, cases uh, were documented by their physicians, of course. 
Um, the, the second one, the client, the graduate student, I have a little story to tell you that's very interesting. After a really powerful session we had, um, she told me in the session she realized her anxiety about going away from the city she lived in to going out of, you know, out of that place and far away to graduate school. And uh, she was worried about you know, leaving me. She was worried, worried about the amount of therapy and, and anxiety control and all that. She was also worried about being away from a doctor. She needed a doctor. And we talked about what could she do to release this anxiety and to feel really good about this exciting experience that she was very, you know, about to, to take on and as a graduate student. And she's, I told her to, or I asked her, really, what, could she just you know, look for a sign that everything was going to be okay for her, that she was going to have peace with this, and that she could move on? And the next day, she called me up, and she said that when she got home, that, you know, she went to sleep, and she had a little balcony that she always went out and had her morning tea, and um, on the balcony, there was a, a, a amaryllis flower. I don't know if you've ever seen one with the really beautiful, magnificent. And it hadn't bloomed in years. And there it was in full bloom, this bright red amaryllis flower uh, in full bloom. All three flowers bloomed at once. It's, 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 they, that's how they, they're, they grow. And they either grew one at a time. Or she'd never seen it bloom like this. And she was so excited, and she said now she knew she was going to be okay. And the guy with the three results, um, they access, access this client's inner voice and spiritual self through mystical experience, facilitating empowerment for emotional healing, anxiety reduction, and physical healing, cancer-free for over five years after therapy is monitored by client's physician. From discovery to research, these two clinical cases require independent replication and controlled studies with sufficient numbers for reliability. Why don't you ask some of the questions that come up from this guided imagery? And um, a couple of the questions that come up are, um, can this anecdotal success in reducing tumors with guided imagery and psychotherapy be replicated and independently validated? And can psychedelic assisted psycho, uh, psychotherapy be, I mean therapy, sorry, be integrated into conventional psychotherapy with guided imagery in order to accelerate the healing process, as opposed to simply doing psycho, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy without guided imagery? And so a couple of things are going on here. First, uh, uh, trying to get a deeper understanding of the mystical experience and its role, and then making some comparisons showing that mystical experience has been infected uh, in psychotherapy with guided imagery without psychedelics and also in the Johns Hopkins clinical studies. Uh, coming back to the um, psychedelic therapy results, uh, Johns Hopkins concludes a single moderate high dose of psilocybin can produce substantial and enduring decreases in anxiety and depression in patients with life-threatening cancer diagnosis, which inspired Julie and, um, and uh, me to ask a couple of questions related to this form of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, which, Joe, as you well know, is, is gaining a lot of traction um, as a way to bring uh, and is you know on the verge of is in the midst of cl of clinical trials uh, that will hopefully lead to this being legalized as a uh, as a uh, available form of of psychotherapy. Uh, the questions are: Can psychedelic assisted psychotherapy be used not only to alleviate the psychological anxiety, as we saw at Johns Hopkins, uh, and the depression, but can it also be used to facilitate the physiological healing in cancer patients, as Julia has done through facilitating mystical experiences? That's a big question. The second one is, in time, are we going to see what today is long-term 
costly clinical psychotherapy of a variety of modalities eventually be enhanced by short-term, much more affordable psychedelic psychotherapy. So are we going to see any of this? And I think this is a good place for us to pause and uh, see if you have questions about these areas we've covered between the Johns Hopkins research and uh, Julie's research with guided imagery and the impact on clients. Well, I think this is really interesting. The when I think of, you know, personally, my framework is that it's all in the individual, right? Like this, this idea that psychedelics could have similarly amazing results with, with, um, uh, physiological situations like cancer. It, to me, it's more about the human body's healing response. Right. And this is kind of what it sounds like Julie's unlocking with guided imagery. It's the potential inherent in the human body in the human organism. And, it can self heal at times. It's, you know, it's really hard to predict always, but you know, it, it's pretty amazing. And I, I would love to see that. It, it, how do you frame that? Do you, do you think it's something in the compound or it's something about restructuring the, the psyche a little bit, reorienting the psyche around illness or, or how to, how do you frame that Julie or Jerry? Um, I think I'll talk about that. Um, the way I'm, Frame is an interesting word here. Um, I think of it as a as a picture in a way um, that parts that the par- parts of the person are um, need to be willing to to heal. Yes, and that's I'd say a very very important part. And then it's my job if they're scared or they're anxious or they're depressed to help them work through those feelings with imagery, with psychotherapy, and with um, all the tools I've used to, to help them with. Also, the, the trust, there's something about, very, very important about trust and the client-therapist relationship. And that is that if the trust isn't there from the very beginning, in the first session, then it's probably not going to work. And I have clients that came in and they just didn't feel comfortable with me or the chemistry wasn't right and they didn't work with me. Um, and then I had other clients that, like the doctor I talked about, who sat down on my couch and he looked me in the eyes and he said, at the end of the session, I will do anything you tell me to do. So... That's a big part of it right there. Right. Therapeutic you know, alliance is always something that we bring up. But go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. No, say that again, please, Joe. It's about the therapeutic alliance is how we kind of talk about that. Like if, uh-huh. if, there, if it's not a good match, it's not a good match. And, yeah. Yeah. and this is so important. I mean, for, you know, there's a lot of people uh, in programs at, uh, in, in MAPS and in California Institute for Integral Studies being trained uh, as future guides for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And this rapport it reminds me of a finding in a book by Adelaide Bry uh, called Inside Psychotherapy. And she interviewed nine different successful psychotherapists from all kinds of uh, modalities, primal screen, Freudian, Jungian. And she asked them, you know, what do you think the key to your success was? And the number one thing that they said was, it's the rapport with the client. Is mm-hmm. the client going to trust us? It's what you know we might in anthropology refer to as the shamanic chemistry or the shamanic fluid that that exists between the shaman and the people he's he's working with. To you know to allow you to feel confident enough, both with psychedelics or without, to unpeel your onion to get down to the core. And as Julie asked in those questions to her client, you know. What did you really need? What is it, you know, this lifelong thing that's been unfulfilled in you that might have manifested itself in a disease? Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's really, really brilliant too, Julie, that, that way of approaching it. Like I, I recall reading, I think it's a uh, Mate's when the body says no, and it's eventually like yeah. your, your body's essentially saying, Hey, uh, if I had enough, I'm out. Or like, I'm going to punish you a little bit till you kind of redirect or something like that. And it's, it's a really interesting mechanism, right? Yes. Um, 
Well, didn't your, what did your, your father, who was a anesthesiologist, say about disease? Where it he began? said all disease starts in the mind. Mm. That's where I came up with that, I guess. Right. I wanted to be a doctor, but he said, you know, disease starts in the mind, and we know less and less every day, but psychology will open the doors. Right. I remember reading some graph about this is like it, it starts as like a subtle energetic emotional yeah. thing and can eventually concretize into like um, the more gross levels of the body and energetic systems. It's really, really a fascinating kind of like <clears throat> uh-huh. know, yeah. uh, e- e- traditional Chinese medicine, perhaps way of looking at it of like <laughs> energy blockages and, and emotions really feeding that. Yes. Yeah, and Groff laid this all out. I mean, this this Johns Hopkins work is really important and is prominent right now. But Groff um, and Joan Halifax uh, at the Spring Grove uh, Mental Hospital in um, in Baltimore uh, did a whole series of research of administering high dose LSD to terminal cancer patients, and they published their findings in a book, a really important book in this field mm. called The Human Encounter with Death, Stanislav Groff, Joan Halifax, The Human Encounter with Death. And this is, they documented the same thing, the, the psychological, emotional basis of disease that became apparent and revealed uh, to these terminal cancer patients through these high dose uh, guided LSD uh, sessions. You, you asked me a while ago, Joe, and if you want me, I can come back to it now of, uh, to talk about a, uh, one of favorite mystical experiences from past times, and I can address that right now. Yeah, I think that would work before we jump into that next bigger topic. Sure. Uh, so, so in our book, The Psychedelic Gospels, we documented psychedelic mushrooms in early and medieval Christian art from about 300 A.D., up through the Middle Ages when it ceased, uh, mainly due to the um, Inquisition brought on by the Black Plague. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just that, since we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, that Black Plague in a very short period of time, I think it was about 1348 to 1352, wiped out 60% of the population of Europe, according to some estimates. So uh, this battle with the germs has been going on for quite some time. Oh yeah. Anyway, uh, there, there is no Christian art before 200, mainly because of persecution, poverty. There are no buildings mm-hmm. or places to do this art. So Julie and I went back into the, uh, the uh, canonical Gospels, the regular Gospels, into the, and into the Gnostic Gospels in search of texts that could be interpreted as psychedelic experiences. And uh, one of several that we quote uh, in our book, uh, in a section called The Kingdom of Heaven, is from the Gospel of Thomas. This doesn't mean it was written by the disciple Thomas, but Jesus tells Thomas that they both received knowledge from the same source. And, uh, and from the Gnostic Gospels, and I'm quoting, Jesus says to his disciples, compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. And Thomas says to Jesus, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Jesus says, I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling stream which I have measured out. He who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I shall become he. And the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Now, this is remarkable because obviously Jesus is talking about a drink. And we know how important, in addition to set and setting doses Mm. in psychedelic experience, there's a huge difference between a microdose of LSD and a megadose of LSD. And Jesus is talking about a drink that he has actually measured out. So he knew the quantity. But now they're having a transpersonal experience in which they're, they're merging. Their consciousnesses are merging together and all the things that are hidden are revealed. And of course, we come back to these messages in, in Jesus' parable that the secrets are within. That's, right. that's where the knowledge is. So this is one of many, and you can go through Jacob's Ladder and, and Paul's revelations of many mystical experiences 
in the Bible, some spontaneously occurring and others uh, which we think we've uh, documented through uh, psychedelics. If you'd like, I can turn to the uh, last section of uh, what we'd like to talk about is, you know, how does this mystical experience actually heal? Yes, please. Okay. So one of the observations that Roland Griffiths of Johns Hopkins made was that psilocybin enables the understanding that everything's well. It's everything's well in the universe and for me in the largest frame. Now, what is that largest frame that the cancer patient or the psychotherapy patient understands? Well, Robin Carhart Harris, uh, the neuro, uh, neurological researcher at Imperial College in London and his colleagues have done a remarkable series of studies in which they've been able to actually take MRIs, magnetic resonance images of the brain, uh, both uh, before and after psychedelics. I think we can, most of some of us will remember Nancy Reagan's old uh, TV commercial campaign, this is your brain, and this is your brain on drugs, and oh, yeah. the eggs, and then the fried eggs. <laughs> well, uh, this is your brain, and this is your brain on uh, psychedelics uh, in the Carhart-Harris research. And what he concluded was that we, in our ordinary consciousness, we're in a default mode network. You know, we're, we're kind of familiar from computers to the default mode of this app or this program. Well, the, dep- the brain in ordinary consciousness has a default mode network. And what psychedelics does, it it helps the brain transcend, leap out, surpass that default mode network, and it creates a super highway to the unconscious. Uh, In the article that we uh, published in Your Psychedelics Today on mystical experience and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, which is up on your blog, uh, we included a... a, um, image from the Journal of Royal Society where Carhart and his colleagues, uh, Carhart Harris, presented their findings. And it includes an image on the brains of the brain's neural pathway before using magic mushroom psilocybin. And what you see is the brain at rest. And there are a number of, you know, very easily identified neural pathways that are activated. That same subject now, after ingesting magic mushrooms, the brain is literally crisscrossed with multiple connections, interconnecting different uh, super highways to different uh, parts of the brain. So that kind of expression that we only use about 10% of our brain, now we see the brain uh, extensively activated. What's going on in that unconscious? Well, the great uh, psychologist Carl G. Jung identified a spiritual self, which he says can be accessed from the unconscious in dreams, but we also know that it can be accessed through psychedelics and also through guided imagery. And it is the spiritual self that seems to hold this knowledge Uh, for healing and for inspiration and for confidence and for synchronicity and faith into the future. Uh, To kind of make an analogy about this, let's take an analogy from astrophysics. In astrophysics, dark matter, which they say makes up most of the universe, it cannot be directly detected or seen. It can only be implied through the gravitational effects that it causes. So in psychology, mystical experience cannot be easily accessed, but it can be reliably created both through psychedelics and as Julie's work has shown through guided imagery. In other words, hidden from ordinary consciousness, mystical experience manifests from the dark matter of the mind to facilitate healing. Uh, Julie and I hope that these reflections on mystical experience and on its role in psychotherapy will inspire, you know, a whole conversation of explorations into this unique and uh, time-worn, revered topic of mystical experience that now holds a key to health and well-being. And I'd like to conclude, if I might, Joe, with a little hypothesis 
about mystical experience. Do we have time for that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's true. And as you pointed out in your question, we know that mystical experience is not only a, uh, a seminal and key phenomena in psychotherapy, both with psychedelics or without psychedelics. We know that it's occurred historically among religious mystics, uh, either through a direct access to experience of the Godhead or the divine, uh, or through communication with divine messengers. We know that mystical experience has uh, happened to people who, have, who are going through near-death experiences. And we also know uh, that mystical experience can happen in creativity, both in science and in, in the arts. And in a remarkable book by Willis Harmon, Willis Harmon was an engineer, and back in the 60s, he collaborated with uh, Jim Fadiman to do the original research on psychedelics and scientific creativity, where they gave psychedelics to mature scientists, uh, 81% of who reached, reached conclusions and solutions to, to scientific, mathematical, architectural problems they'd been working on for six months without a solution. But in a book called Higher Creativity, uh, what, which was published back in 1984, Harmon showed that genius uh, geniuses like Newton and Einstein and Tesla and artists like Mozart and Puccini received their inspiration through expanded states of consciousness and channeled cosmic creative energy. To try to put this into a meaningful framework, I come back to uh, Stanislav Grof, right, the giant in this field of psychedelics and research and, and therapy who after decades of uh, systematic studies in, on human consciousness, and as we know, uh, Groff has probably guided, thousands, well, he has guided yeah. thousands of, of LSD uh, trips in his research and uh, probably has done more of that than, than any living person, well, than any person, actually. And Groff concluded, I, and I quote from The Holotropic Mind, I see consciousness and the human psyche as expressions and reflections of a cosmic intelligence that permeates the entire universe and all of existence. We are not simply evolved animals with a sophisticated biological computer in our skulls. We are also fields of consciousness without limits, transcending time, space, matter, and limit linear causality. End of quote. In other words, and, and here's what our hypothesis is, is that in the mystical experience, we can tap in to these fields of consciousness that are out there, that are existing, that are real phenomena, but that are not available to us in ordinary consciousness. Yeah, that's important. I, I really appreciate that, Jerry. I feel a little negligent for having not read Higher Creativity yet because that's a huge topic for me, like this ability to creatively solve a lot of the problems we're facing today. This is kind of like the big thing I think about with psychedelics. Um, you know, healing is, is amazing too, but you know, we're in this kind of uh, predicament in the global scale with um, converging crises like climate change and, and plenty of other things that we really need to put our heads together and, and sort out. So this idea of creativity and, and just unlocking the human potential and accessing the hidden kind of like uh, with your Jesus quote there, like all things hidden will be revealed. Like, yeah, there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot of opportunity. It's really hard to kind of understate the opportunity we have available. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the things, and, and um, look, I, th I think that the researchers at Johns Hopkins and certainly at MAPS, probably uh, NYU, you know, they're, they're rightfully extremely excited about the potential, potential of psychedelics to help people dealing with serious uh, psychological problems and, and possibly in Julie, that's in Julie's work, even with physiological problems as, as cancer. And maybe they'll be, the researchers are a little reluctant to talk about unlocking the potential for healthy human beings, uh, kind of uh, 
wanting to protect this newfound respectability of psychedelics uh, in the media, certainly the, the great breakthrough that Michael Pollan's book has helped us achieve, uh, How to Change Your Mind, and as a best-selling author, he's been on all the talk shows. We're seeing Netflix series on psychedelics. So there's really a huge shift uh, from the negativity towards psychedelics of the entire 70s and 80s and part of the 90s into the psychedelic renaissance. But certainly this can unlock um, a, a tremendous potential for, for creativity. Uh, certainly the microdosing of LSD and psilocybin has uh, Silicon Valley all excited. I think there was a um, Rolling Stone article, uh, this is the drug your, your employer would like you to take. And uh, going back to Harmon, uh, and in that book, uh, I forget who wrote it, uh, what the Dormouse said, who indicated that it, that uh, probably the, the vast majority of the engineers who brought the personal computer about were also involved in, in, in psychedelic culture. So certainly it unlocks uh, this, and this is why Steve Jobs was quoted um, by his biographer as saying that, you know, LSD was one of the two or three most significant experiences in his life that allowed him to think different, which became the, um, the logo of uh, Apple. So certainly it's hard not to get too excited. And I think if we do it right this time, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author said, there's no second acts, there's no second acts in American lives, but uh, fortunately psychedelics is, is having its second act. And I think if we do it right this time, uh, we can, really integrate it uh, into our culture, both in a therapeutic session and in a, in a therapeutic setting. And as Julie and I, just like uh, modeled after the Greek Eleusinian mysteries, where healthy people can go to explore psychedelics for personal growth and for uh, spirituality and creativity. Mm. Yeah, I would certainly like to uh, do this at Eleusis. So <laughs> even if we don't do it at Eleusis, if it's, if it seems somewhat similar, that'd be nice. That's a great idea. <laughs> I, yeah. That's uh, my number one uh, pit stop in Greece. If, uh, if, and when I ever get there. It's a marvelous oh, archeological site, uh, which we visited. There's a few photographs of it in our, our book. And, um, you know, as uh, many of your listeners probably know that uh, in the book, uh, called The Road to Eleusis, where Gordon Wasson, the uh, father of modern ethnomycology, Albert Hoffman, the synthesizer of LSD, and Carl Rook, the great uh, Greek classical scholar, identified the uh, kikion, the mysterious element in the potion that was given uh, to the, um, the uh, participants and the initiates in the Eleusinian mysteries as a psych LSD fungal-like substance, Claviceps purpurea that grows on barley and rye in the plains around Eleusis. By the way, uh, Eleusis, which is not far from Athens, is an archeological site today that can be visited. And I recommend anyone uh, interested in psychedelics who gets to Athens to, it's well worth the trip and they have a, a museum there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and for those who don't know, the um, Eleusinian mysteries or the rites of Eleusis were annual. Or was it every four years, every two years? Do you recall? Uh, it was it was every year. Every year, there okay. was a lesser mystery in preparation, and then it occurred every year. And any citizen of Greece who was not a murderer, uh, who had not been convicted of murder, was allowed to participate. Mm. And it was a sacred ceremony, and there were two priestly families who administered Eleusis and who kept the rites and administered the Kikion. And you were, and, and Plato and Socrates and, and many of the uh, people who laid the foundations of Western civilization in Greek, you know, from Greek arts and sciences participated. And however, you were not allowed to speak uh, about what you experienced. At Eleusis, upon pain of death, so it was a it was a, a phenomenal ritual. There is a sacred road that leads out of Athens, and there is still the archaeological remains of it, where the um, initiates would walk 
um, the seven miles to uh, Eleusis. And uh, that's still visible uh, today. And, and the, I think the important part is this was a shamanic right. This was a right to explore the other worlds. And it went on, uh, not in the forest, but at a major Greek site. And it went on, Joe, for 2,000 years, from about 1500 BC to 400 AD, approximately, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and it was uh, banned as a, as a form of paganism. Right. And anybody who is anybody, essentially, in, in Greek ancient culture was a member. I think that's really important to know as well. Uh, many Sophocles, Plato... Uh, participated, uh, politicians participated, many of the great names of, uh, of Greek philosophy, mathematics, science, uh, politics uh, participated. Even the Roman emperors went. It kind of went from being a local uh, right in Eleusis to being uh, a Panhellenic right throughout Greece. And then when Greece was conquered by Rome, it became available to citizens of Rome as well. Right. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And it's a, it's, it's a it really is. valuable story um, that people... Yeah, and, and Albert Hoffman, uh, you know, in, I, I, I don't know if it was in his book, LSD, A Problem Child or My Problem Child or one of his other writings said that, you know, he looked to Eleusis as a model of hopefully how we could integrate uh, psychedelics into modern society. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, this is a really interesting topic, and I really want to thank you both. This this idea of mystical states is kind of underexplored by the more hard nosed folks. Like, what is a myst? Like, we've got the MEQ, the mystical experience questionnaire, but it's kind of it's hard to think of of a wildly rich experience being summed up by a questionnaire. You know, in in some sense, it feels like it minimizes the importance of the experience to like kind of boil it down to, to a questionnaire, but it still does help point in the direction. And this is just kind of how science has to operate, unfortunately, but it does point us in the direction that these states are very valuable and very helpful. Um, there's a long historical tradition of these things and they still happen spontaneously all the time. And you don't need psychedelics to pull these states, uh, to make these states happen though. It's, perhaps the most reliable means. Or maybe, Julie, could you speak to that? Do you, do you feel like you're, with your guided imagery work, if, if you've got the right fit with a person, you can fairly reliably make these um, mystical states happen? Well, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I'll say this, that it, it's, they happen when they happen. And mm-hmm. can you, you can't really make them happen. It's one of those kind of alchemical experiences. Right. The stars have to be aligned and whatnot. So, yeah, like things have to be, it has to, everything has to come together. And um, so I've had quite a few of them in my practice over the years. And sometimes people call them breakthroughs or, but the mystical part, I mean, mystical, mystic is an interesting word in itself. And I don't know if every one of my clients that healed had mystical experiences. Um, I would say they had breakthroughs and they, um, they worked hard to heal themselves also. And I don't, I am just the, the guide, you know, into the forest. Um, but um, I think that, that, they, they can happen when you are open and you and and you're willing, you know, open and willing. Those two words, and that's when they happen. But to get there is a whole other thing too. And it's I think that if you work a long time to get there, or whether you take a you know a psychedelic and get there faster, I don't know if there's a lot of difference between those two. That's why I'm so interested in seeing uh, the psychedelic psychotherapy combined with guided imagery. I think it would be uh, just a huge breakthrough for a healing. Yeah, and, and Joe, I think this is, um, 
you know, I mean, Julie obviously is <laughs> not the only person. Many people have worked with visualization and guided imagery who work with, uh, with psychotherapy. And a lot of this comes out of the work of Roberto Asagioli and, and psychosynthesis. Um, um, which, uh, yeah. yeah. And what uh, we may be, the book What We May Be is a wonderful book but, on psychosynthesis. But what's happening here is that the uh, mystical experiences allows the inner healing potential of what Jung identified as the spiritual self to emerge and guide the person and empower the person yeah. uh, to healing. Yeah. And, I, and I also want to say that, of course, it's, it's obvious from the elements of the mystical experience, you can never put it completely in words. You also never forget it uh, when you've had a mystical experience. Um, but it's not a bad thing that uh, from Panky on to Johns Hopkins, that they've refined this into a questionnaire that's mm -hmm. been refined. It's been multivariate analyzed. It's been validated, and it, it becomes a predictable, uh, you know, scientific and socio uh, psychological tool for measuring mystical experience. And that gives the researchers comfort that yeah, we have a phenomena here that we can measure and replicate and validate. And that's really important for moving this into the um, you know, scientific uh, and psychological mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, the, the measures are really important for psychology to have. And yeah, it's totally helpful. And yeah, thank you both for that. I'm kind of curious if there's anything else we want to add in here or, or might we have hit everything? You know, we could talk for a long time about these topics, about yeah. the psychedelic gospel, but I think we've, we've, we've covered a good bit of material today. And uh, I think the last thing I, I want to say, and it's not new information, is that uh, if the people listening want to follow our work, uh, you can find us on the web at psychedelic gospels, one word, psychedeliggospels.com. Uh, you can see our Facebook page is psychedelic gospels on Facebook, Psychedelic Gospels, where we post both our research and also you know, latest findings as they occur from the psychedelic renaissance. Uh, if you have questions for me or Julie, you can email me at jbbrown, j-b-b-r-o-w-n, at gate.net, jbbrown at gate.net. If any questions for Julie, I will pass them on to her be happy to address them. And of course you have, uh, your, your listeners can look at the article that you published there. Thank you again. in psychedelics today on May 28th, your the blog on mystical experience and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So we thank you for the opportunity to, to share these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really happy that you were willing to publish here and willing to come on the show to share these uh, thoughts. It's really important that, therapists and, and clinicians and researchers get a handle on these concepts so that, you know, we can really accelerate the field of psychology and healing and the betterment of the well. And uh, perhaps <laughs> bringing back that old time religion. <laughs> Amen. 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 All right. Well, thank you both and uh, hope to have you on the show again. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank it's a pleasure. You. And there you have it, Julie and Jerry Brown. Thank you both for joining us. And I hope you all enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. And if you liked it, please, please, please spread the word. Share it with some friends. We would love to have new listeners. And uh, again, if you want to support us, leave us a review on Facebook or your podcasting app or iTunes even. And anything helps. If you want to help us financially, we, we take donations over at patreon.com slash psychedelics today, uh, as low as $2 a month, and you can help us quite a bit. Also, we've got shirts and mugs and all sorts of cool stuff available over at psychedelicstodayshop.com and plenty of education over at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. So I hope you all enjoyed this and thank you all for tuning in. Thanks again to Julie and Jerry, and we'll see you on the next episode. Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelics Today. See you next time. Psychedelics Today.